Good day, everybody. I hope you're well. I say good day now because I always say good evening, even though it's not evening everywhere. It seems like a pointless thing to say, but good day. I hope you're doing well. Um, so, um, and we're on time as well, exactly on time, which means something else is going to go wrong. There's going to be, I don't know, some kind of a explosion or something. Well, touch wood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just said <laughs> just before we started, I said um, hopefully nothing. I can't remember the context in which I said it, but I said hopefully nothing will go wrong. Touch wood, and I touch wood because my desk is made of wood. And um, Amanda James and she were like, "Touch wood? That's weird. It's just something as bizarre <laughs> British people say." Um, uh, just it's like a super super superstitious thing. So you'll say like, hopefully today will be good. Touch wood, you know, which you actually yeah, then have to find the wood and thing. touch it. Right, but we say knock on wood. Oh, we don't we don't just touch it. Yeah, we, knock. we, we, we don't make it sexual. Goddamn. We're <laughs> <laughs> um, gentle. So. Um, yeah, I did a bit of a philosophical video yesterday, which I like to do. I really do enjoy them. Um, and I believe life is all about balance. So going from talking about the deeper aspects of Lorne's nat- crazy mind and his his motivations and what makes him like he is, sometimes you've just got to have fun. And there is nothing funnier than the lawsuits, literally. I I Even now, I've got my head in my hand and I'm like, I can't believe that someone wrote that and amanda james you kind of um i don't think you were uh, have read through it before uh, you th- the words that you wrote uh, read um you didn't uh, last week you not have you not seen them before no i th- i'd seen i knew he said that she lured him there with her female powers and i knew he said that he unintentionally traveled i i knew of those quotes but i had never actually read it in full context before so it was still kind of shocking to see that somebody would actually write those words and try to use that as a defense it is it even though we kind of um like you said we know what he said but when you read it and you in the in the context that it is it's remarkable, isn't it? And uh, like you know, yeah. we've beaten this, we've beaten lawn ra- this lawn scenario around the head for years, haven't we? And it's like you would think that we'd just get over it and move on with our lives, but yet I still find it interesting. It's weird, isn't it? It's still funny. It's, it's still, still funny. funny. Uh huh. It hasn't lost this comedic edge yet. I mean, it, there's just even when you go back and do the same material, you know. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't see any end to this, but... Uh... I know, it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> well, I you know what? Phases. I want to be, just very quickly, I want to be buried when I die with a copy of the Holy Lornography. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got it. I'll make sure. Please do. <laughs> one's still alive. Just, just I want, right, a copy of an Oasis album in one hand, right, okay. a Star Wars lightsaber attached to my belt, and a copy of the Holy Lornography in the other <laughs> And then I'll die happy. <laughs> Your family will love that. <laughs> His last wish. Have to honor it. Yeah. Um, what lightsaber? What color? Uh, it's going to have to be blue. It's my favorite color. Okay. That, oh, thank, right. You see, you're thinking, I, I like that, Amanda James. You're actually like going mm-hmm. that one step further and going, what color lightsaber? Next be a bit, right, okay. Uh, how, do you want a double-edged <laughs> lightsaber? Let's not go there anyway. Um, yeah. So yeah, I uh, yeah, um, I had a great time. I actually, Amanda James, right, guiltily, listened to your reaction to it quite a few times and played it back because it was funny. <laughs> like, just as you, were, what was really good is there was a bit where you was reading just before it got to the 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 decoy would not stop her sly and persuasive chat and you just went oh god and then he had to pause and then read it again it was really funny because the, her chat was so far from sly or persuasive she was if she was a real child she'd be a, a, a slow child like not intelligent or thoughtful I mean, all her responses were yeah, I, just one fact- syllable yeah, I mean, just the fact that he thinks that a thirteen-year-old girl has 
female powers. That they somehow develop powers of, you know, I don't know, adult sexuality or something, and are able to harness them and use them to draw in vulnerable people like him. It's just the fact that, and and also the other thing that stuck out was when he said, uh, as if chatting with a minor is is not a terrible thing or something. That like was that. a yeah. huge thing that we could do a stream just on that and just on female powers. You know what's really interesting about the lawn thing, and people do beat me over head with it. Some friends like get in life, dude, get over it. We could do a stream. The three of us could talk for two hours just about his female powers comment. Yeah. Couldn't mm-hmm. we? And 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 why that's important, why he said that, and why it's funny, why it means something to him, why it's kind of disturbing. And also, exactly, Shim, with what you just said about the, um, when he said, and I made a video about that, when he said, is not such a terrible offence. It's a huge thing for him to come out with, and that is indicative to his whole... Um, uh, sort of, f- f- you know, his his whole take on this situation, isn't it? Yes, I, he truly believes that. That's why he thinks it's so unfair that he was put on national television, and that he has to attend sex offender treatment, and he's on probation, and he's on a registry where everybody knows because he doesn't think he did anything that bad. What a lovely. Not man. even counting his the real girl at least one that we know of that he you know exposed and groomed and and mistreated he doesn't well, he, think it was that bad of a thing because they were friends because right. he, they, it's not a terrible yeah. thing it's not a terrible crime i think he says but what he said was uh it's not a terrible crime to chat with a minor and and mm-hmm. the thing is you put a footnote at chat and you know and go back to the footnotes and you read chatting includes showing your dick uh, did da 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 all this other stuff. So it's not just like talking, you know. It's it's chatting is is encompasses so much of his crime, uh, so much abuse, right? Yeah, it's not, exactly. He he he's you know making it seem like oh I just talked to her, I just right. harmlessly flirted. He <laughs> t- told he exposed himself to her. He tried to get her to experiment to violate herself for him to yeah. go against what her parents said. Yeah, um, yeah, to lie to them and sneak. You know, he did all kinds of terrible things. It's not the shitty grades. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, build your life around a thirty-seven-year-old, you know, man. It's really weird. He's really a. He's he's not just a a, a child molester or potential. He's a childhood killer. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what all predators are, aren't they? All of these people are quite happy. They don't. I mean, we could. It's an interesting scenario. Do they all believe they are ruining the girls' lives? For instance, I think there are some of them that think that they'll enjoy it and that they'll both get something out of it, and there's actually nothing wrong with it. Some girls, a fourteen-year-old, especially as we go further along in, you know, in our kind of species and our relationship to sexuality, some girls of fourteen, fifteen become sexually active that age go with much older men some of them will be damaged from it will all people that age be damaged from it well sex with an old older person yeah yeah yes that first of all the trust issue is is Mm -hmm. you know um we we went through this before on another stream where we talked about how the link is is equally as psychologically damaging uh, to these people, uh, and that's where you know seventy five percent of the abuse takes place. Um, oh, by the way, uh, Dustin, this is Amanda James with us. So, you know who the woman was? Not the real Amanda James. Uh, Dustin <laughs> Fetridge's crippled nemesis wanted to know um, who you were, Amanda James. Um, this is our good friend Amanda James, who's been doing streams with us for how long? Have you been doing these with us? Hmm. Wow, what? It's been it's good a few months, isn't it? It's been a while. I really can't even say how long it's been. Um, it's such, a, such a source of shame for you. You, you got to... <laughs> I, I do. You tell your what... friends you do this. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah, some of them. Yeah, and they're really surprised, and they they try to find out like what channel I'm on and who I'm talking to, and I 
that's like an invasion of my privacy, so I hide it. Um, they probably look. They probably uh, look you up with your real name. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I love your eyes. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um. Uh. So yeah, I I think that um, what we were talking about, uh, you, uh, Shin said that you know he's he's a kind of child, you know, like a, he, what you're trying to say is he wants to destroy the young a young person's life. It's not necessarily one of his goals. It's, he doesn't have like a a piece of paper that says right, ruin girl's life, ruin a financially scam an old couple. He knows that there's a potential for it, but doesn't care. Although, we did say when we were talking to Tiffany in a stream once that his, his kind of awareness levels are not that astute, where he wouldn't, you know, how much is his level of awareness? Did he know? He knew that he shouldn't have been doing what he was doing with Kayla. We know that. But was he aware enough to know the damage that it would cause? Because Tiffany struggled no. to get that out of him in a call, didn't she? No, no, he he didn't have a clue. I, 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 I he th- he treated this as as an adult adult relationship completely. But you know the thing is, once he's groomed these guys, these people, you know, we haven't seen it with Kale yet because he, you know, she wasn't real. But we've seen it with some of the catfish. He starts to then he starts to exert his control and he gets extremely aggressive, and um, and 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 it probably scares some some real life minor now I'm, t- I'm speaking of of uh, molly for instance think of every relationship we have seen him in or pseudo relationship whatever it is starting with derek he, he went off on a jealousy rant on him he, and that's about as mild as we've ever seen him get jealous then we then of course the doctor the therapist all these other people who's to say he didn't do this with a real child just just basically uh, went on t- on some jealous rage about another guy he 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 described it as being oh he stepped away for her own good. We know that's not true. You know we know that he probably coerced her. Are we talking about victim he, number one here? The victim uh, victim one, yeah. So once he you know MySpace part, MySpace girl for anybody who's wondering MySpace right. We don't like to say a name, even though a name did get uttered last week. It's not a big deal. I just from a personal level, right. It's not a big right. deal. But that's part of his game. We don't see here. You know, um, it, with the Kayla thing, and but we can only imagine what went, what was happening with, uh, you know, with MySpace girl, and probably was the nexus, uh, was the um, uh, reason, the impetus. I'd the love to know more about that. You know, when we talk about jokingly, I sort of time travel vouchers. Um, for comedy amusement, I'd love to have seen him at his computer talking to Kayla. I mean, oh my god, it literally. Oh, I said I wanted to be in the room. But, um, what you but, said? What? Sorry. I said I wanted to be in his apartment. Now that's uh, what I meant. In his apartment, whilst uh, he's talking to yeah. Kayla. Did you? Yeah. What was yours, Amanda James? Forgive me, but I can't remember. I can't remember either. I have several. <laughs> did you um, did. You cheated. I think you had about three. Yeah. What? I, what was mine, Shin? I think you, you wanted to be at a karaoke bar. No, that, I thought was that was Tiffany. Tiffany. Yeah, that was, that Tiffany. was Tiffany. I, well, I don't know which one I told you guys, but I know I would like to have been a fly on the wall at his probation office when he asked his probation officer if he could fly to California to marry oh, yeah. his dying girlfriend. Yeah. Um, any yeah. of the times when when his when his handlers, his counselor, his therapist, or his probation officer, or um, during his therapy sessions when he would cry about Ramona. I would really like to see that. I just want to see the look on these people's faces when they, of course, realize that Lauren is being catfished over and over, and they try to convince him of that, and he refuses to believe it. I would just want to see what they, how they try to persuade him that you know, to stop talking to, to fake people his entire life. Well, again, knowing what we know about Lauren, he probably just agreed with them and then just carried on with his own thing. That's my guess. I don't Absolutely. think he would. He doesn't have any facts on his side. Uh, as a matter of fact, all the facts cut against him. You know, oh, well, what about Laura? What about Yeah, you know, all yeah well, during his relationship with Ramona, he would go on and on about how, 
you know, he fought for her. He stood up for her. He was trying to get his class to believe in her. You know, that's where <laughs> I, the, I believe in you started. We forgot. We uh, That was one of the uh, time tokens. We wanted to be in the rape class for one of these things. Oh, yeah. yeah that's uh, pretty dark, uh, though. Was that? <laughs> I bet there were some hilarious moments in that rape class, you know, that he mm-hmm. went to. I can imagine... Oh God! Just think, right, of all the funny moments that we've had out along, like whether it be the catfishing or, you know, phone calls from the sting, you know, whatever. Just think of the unknown classic, because he says things which shouldn't be funny, but just hilarious. Just think of all the things we've missed. Yeah, this, he should. Oh. If I had, if I did have a time travel voucher, I'd like put some kind of tracking device on him where we could like forever listen to him and watch him. Forever, <laughs> just be like it, you know, just the most amazing reality TV, the real long reality show. <laughs> yep. I mean, if it was a short time span where you know, uh, you know, you'd come back to your own universe and time in say like ten seconds, I would pick uh, the time that he drove into probation. He was all happy and talk, uh, leaving a message for Tiffany, and then when he got hooked up, I want to see his re- that whole scene when he that ten mm-hmm. seconds. For that. You know, the probation officer and the U.S. Marshal's there to put handcuffs on him. I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, yeah, that'd be, that'd be... There's so many moments in there, but I'd love to know more about the um, about the victim number one um, um, relationship because I think that was the catalyst for his predatory behaviour. Yeah. Um, oh, know, yeah. Uh, Clobber has a good one. Uh, the PO's face when he tried to get permission to film the chair aerobics with Sylvester Stallone. How did he know about that? As it is? Yes, that's a perfect example. I I just want to see the look on their face when he comes up with these ridiculous things <laughs> and insists that he yeah. has celebrity supporters. <laughs> yes. Um, so all many his moments. Delusions. It's just mm-hmm. it's crazy, isn't it? You know, what we, what we could do is we could do it like a. We'll do a stream one week and have loads of people on, and everybody can pick. Everybody gets one time travel token, and <laughs> we can see what ones people come up with. Mine's ridiculously Mr. predictable. Boy, really. hmm? Mr. Uh-huh. Jealous boy, all the things he gets to see. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, um, without further ado, let's um, have a look at the. Um, it's it's. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah. It usually is okay for me, but it'll come up. Andrew, can I say something about this real quick? Uh, very just a yeah. Little Back preface. On, dude. It's really hard to legally analyze, folks. Just so you know, I mean, it, to have somebody who has legal experience or whatnot, you know, they could when you have a uh, they can try to wade their way through what he's trying to say and what he's trying to do and what his argument structures are. But it's really, really difficult. This is, I think, a better expert will be a kindergarten teacher. This is really, really hard to uh, uh, to analyze um, uh, as a lawyer. You know, this is. Uh, is it why though? Is it because he doesn't make any sense? He's all, with all his... over the place. He's all over the place, and you know, obviously, you could tell what the boilerplate stuff is. And, no, but you can't you know, make that. sense of something that doesn't make sense, dude. So that's not your fault that Lon doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah, I mean, even procedurally, you know, I'm never quite sure what he's doing. But anyway, that's it. I'm sure he wasn't either. What's interesting, when you were talking last week, Amanda James, you were going, I'd love to just get him here and ask him what he meant by that. He wouldn't be able to explain it. Like, if you said to him, no, if you showed him this lawsuit and said, what the fuck did you mean by female powers, you fucking weirdo, he'd just deny he wrote it. Or he go, oh, my head was messed up at the time. Or, yeah. So there'd, be, there'd be no, there's no logic. You can't make logic of something that's illogical. So he's not going to say, well, actually, right, I was under a lot of pressure at the time. And, and yeah. uh, you know, I was really feeling really deeply dismayed at the situation. And I felt um, a certain level of betrayal. So female power, he's not going to come up with something like that, is he? He's just going to ramble. But it's still interesting that that, that came out of his brain because... There's a certain honesty to his writing, and please understand the context of what I mean when I say honesty. He believes what he's writing. I don't think there's deliberate deceit in it, because 
why would he write he said no many times? All one would have to do is go to the fucking chat log and just type the word no and see that it never happens. Mm-hmm. I, I believe he, he felt this way all the way up to Tiffany, uh, t- Tiffany's unlisted interview with him, where she went through, where did you say no? And then he finally broke down and she goes, well, what are you trying to do then? And, she, and he says, I guess I, guess I don't know. I think that was probably the time that he finally got off the I, I kept saying no wagon. Um, yeah, I think he talked himself into believing that he actually did say no. He actually didn't want to go there. Uh, but what, what I would ask him is what the hell the phrase unintentionally traveled means. That would be the ultimate question, wouldn't it? You know, because it's confusing. Well, it doesn't. It, it, which we said last week, the only thing that we could think of was like under, you know, at gunpoint or demonic possession. Or, or, or you're in your car and you're sleeping, you accidentally you put it in gear, you know? Yeah. There are explanations, but they're very yeah. outlandish. They, they don't involve a deliberate several hour drive and specific complicated procedures that allow you to get to a specific location at a specific time and say specific things to meet a specific person that can't be speaking of specific what is this idea about turning around on a medium on a super highway or whatever it was who does that who thinks about that just take the next exit and turn around right i mean he said there was no other exit the next but the idea that he would how would that work he would just fly across and merge in and you know, it just it it's weird that that's how he pictured his out. You know, was he so overcome with with uh, I don't know shame? I don't think he has that. But but so why nice. the media? You know that right? That's it makes me. no sense. He could have turned around anywhere. He could have turned around in Kayla's driveway, like a normal person. Went home. <laughs> yeah, it, there's never like a, oh, it's too late. I'm I can't loves- turn around well, here. So. You know, it went down and it got dark and I saw grass. And Okay, you know, that's... It's a typical thing that someone will come up with that you can't disprove. We know it's not the case, but we can't prove that he didn't consider turning round and that he was... The thing is as well, there are some predators caught on to to catch a predator that go in there acting nervous and some of them, you can tell, are not entirely comfortable with what they're doing. There's some... Some of it, you, you could say it's fear of getting caught some of them maybe um like the guy who was on the um the beach is like i'm more nervous than you are you could hear his voice quivering i mean that was fear of getting caught that wasn't fear of him uh i'm looking around yeah we like him don't we he's kind of a bit of a a bit of an hidden gem isn't he (laughs) well most of the predators were nervous but in lauren's case i think he wasn't nervous about getting caught. He was nervous, like, first date jitters. Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Which is one of the things that makes him interesting. You would think a 37-year-old man would be more aware of the situation and and would be afraid, uh-oh, did a neighbor see me? Is, you know, are her parents going to show up? Are friends of her parents going to show up? Am I going to get caught and have my life destroyed? But what made, you know, gave... Lauren Butterflies in his stomach was finally meeting his precious little goddess with her brown hair. It's it's so ridiculous to me. <laughs> What's funny is by the time he sat there with Casey, that was the fourth person to play that character. <laughs> she I went, know. Oh, no, was it the third? No, actually, no. Two, two, was there two or three girls in the photographs? I think there were three. So we've got the- three girls, the girl on the phone and the girl in the chat. So that's four. Five, so Casey mm-hmm. was the sixth person. He still didn't cotton up. <laughs> there was something wrong. Well, he told <laughs> Tiffany he did. That did raise red flags that these girls didn't look like. And he said in the chat, so which I, girl I, is I, you? You sent me pictures of two different girls. One has the gap in her teeth. And so he he saw all that. Yeah. But is still stupid enough to just go with it. And that well, didn't even raise his suspicion. So let's just think that you noticed that like he did, right? 
he didn't get a satisfactory response from the decoy because they can't. You know, what are you going to say? You just have to say, oh, sorry, Lauren, you've had too much to drink. So they probably thought they were doomed at that point. And, but yet you would think that yeah, that would be in the back of his mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't believe that he figured out they were different girls. I think Tiffany was right when uh, when she got him to admit that she knew she was growing and her appearance would change in some of the photographs. I think that was more like it. I He wills himself to believe something so hard that, he, mm-hmm. you know, you're not going to a gap in the tooth or you know, it's more than the gap in tooth. We all know that these, those girls are so different. Uh, right. looking. The only similarity they have is they have blonde hair. That's it. But That's we've seen cool. it happen over and over again since Kayla, he received many different pictures of these women that he was in f- telephone relationships with. Right. And he would pick, he would say, so which one is you? That yeah. girl looks different. I want yeah. to see the dimples, you know, and he, he, he could just, yeah. he could be talked out of it every time he, he would still stick around no matter what, mm. which I, I mean, that shows his desperation. I think you've just, as 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 yeah, it's simply desperation, isn't it? As far as Casey's concerned, he just liked what he saw. That's what I think. Yeah. He's willing to accept any delusion, I you know, at that, that point. It is desperation. And a strong case of it. And I think that it happens for many men and many women. If like you know when you see the little when you see like older women and sometimes men get scammed in these dating uh, on these dating sites because the the, the 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 promised companionship and they don't want to be lonely, so they get like it ends up being some like um African fucking scammer and they fleece them out of the money, and you look at the situation from afar and think, how could they believe? How could this, like, pensioner think that some attractive middle-aged man who's rich would be interested? Because the desperation takes over, because we're so... We're genetically engineered to to the opposite energy polarity, or maybe the same, you know, same sex, whatever, it doesn't matter, but, you know, for that companionship. And with him... There's that as well, which makes him completely just oblivious to everything that's going around him, and he happens to be thick as fuck as well. So um, it's right, a double whammy. It has to be a predisposition they have in order to fall, uh, fall for it. they got to be in a place in their life where they're a little more vulnerable. Like yeah, vulnerable, yeah, which which he obviously picks up on in abundance. He, he kind of is vulnerable, but not in the way that he thinks he is. Yeah. Well, look at all... The... Sorry. Oh, go ahead, Shin. Go ahead. No, I was going to say there's there there are good catfishes and bad catfishes. He falls for them all. You don't even need mm-hmm. to be a catfish. It all, almost all of the predators. I'm always shocked that they believe that a 13 year old girl or boy is interested in them. Look at um, Hamburger. Yes. Yeah. She was um, attractive that... as well. That that decoy. I mean, m- most of the decoys oh, are attractive. Know. But oh. she was the she blonde one who was very quiet. But she was an attractive girl. Yeah, it's a pretty, a, a, a cute, pretty little blonde <laughs> child. Oh, sorry. Who would have a hard time finding a mate? Yeah, that's going to happen. So look for Hambubger. Hambubger was really funny to me because he he was uh, he was into the romantic aspect too. He wanted to probably because he, you know, he's impotent or whatnot. But he wanted to spend time on the beach with her. Can you imagine if you were on the beach? And you saw oh, two think that was a grandfather, wouldn't you? Two girl. You would the... think he would be so self conscious. It's a, a pretty little teenage girl with this zombie corpse grandfather man on the beach. You, you would think that he would just be absolutely repulsed by himself. <clears throat> yeah, you, well, I think everybody's initial impression would be, oh, look at that uh, granddaughter and grandfather. Look at her help the grand. What's he doing? What's he yeah. doing? You know? But just the idea that they think that's re- uh, that that's a, a, um, a rational reality. Mm-hmm. But that that's the underlying theme for all these predators. You know, how can... You know, somebody like you, um, you know, uh, Dustin, <laughs> he, you know, I think that somebody like this 
she's interested in me. Um, well, for Lauren, he we know that he at least appears to have a very high opinion of himself. I think they all do. I think, think they, they think that the age gives them a specific, like a really big advantage. I think that they think that, oh, I'm older, so they're going to be more interested. I'm cleverer than people are yeah. own age, like Lawn did in a way. I have a car. I yeah, it, it's a big, it, they think they've got a massive thing to their advantage there, which is exactly what Lawn thought when he was manipulating Kayla, or thought he was. Um, it does give you a distinct advantage, um, you know. Uh, well, not a distinct advantage, that's the wrong way of putting it, but it, it does, I think that's what a lot of them thought. I think, you know, like you said, Shin, they've got the car, they've got a bit of money, um, they've got things that younger, you know, younger people would um, be attracted Which to. Which they would fall for, you know, being with an older, you know, you know, somebody who has a license at 16 or 17 would be cool. You know, for them to drive around, drive their friends around, get beer even, whatever, whatever they do. But these guys are way over the top. These, these, um, well, and Kayla wasn't like some wild child who was looking for an older guy who could buy her booze and cigarettes and, you know, sneak out and party. She was a little tiny child who didn't even dare to say the F word because it's a bad word and she's not allowed to say it. Yeah. So Lord, his opinion of himself and his looks he he really thinks that especially at the time thought he was attractive enough that this little girl would look at him and think he was cute remember in the chat log he even said do you have a crush on me do you think i look cute on cam he doesn't he doesn't ask her he just he, he says she does uh, you must have right a, mm -hmm. you know? but you know these the, the the kind of tactics these guys use i, I would imagine it's the same kind of tactics that a you know, that a pimp would use at a bus station with a runway, with a runaway. Be really nice at first, come with me, you know, that kind of thing. But the, the, the child is more desperate in that situation. But it's the same playbook. It has to be. Trust me, follow me, you know, here's some money or whatever it is. Um, but it's the same uh, predator um, tactics. Yeah. Yeah, there's actually another parallel between, um, like, sex traffickers going after young girls they with the the predators from the show or men like that they try to convince the children that it's their their decision this is something they want so be it the you know young girls who sell their bodies it's their choice they want to do right. it and Lauren the same Bay thing with right are you sure you want to do this uh, i don't you are you going to live your life for yourself or are you going to let your parents rule your life? Or, mm -hmm. you know, he's big on that, you know, uh, divide and conquer bullshit. Um, anyway, without further ado, um, we're at the section here where he, he, he describes what the sting operation is. So this should be good. So, titled The Sting Operation, in 2004, Dateline began producing and broadcasting a series, a series of segments entitled To Catch a Predator. ID f page 14. Uh, I don't know what that is. Is that, a, is that an attachment? Oh, page 14? Yeah, that's. Uh, I thought it just meant an attachment to the document. Oh, id. Id at four, uh, page 14. Okay, so he's going to discuss it Discuss it later. Id in Supra. Supra is before, id is after. Got it. Ah. Interesting. It he's is. Um, NBC characterizes the series as an investigative news series and refers to Dateline as a news program. Working with perverted justice and local police departments, Dateline use, is, uses decoys posing as teenagers online to law with the promise of sex individuals suspected of being sexual predators for sting guys. That's quite a good, um, accurate description of, um, it's very, very succinct, <laughs> I would say. You haven't it? Um, uh, it's accurate. Yeah. The the decoy, who is an adult actor posing as a young teenager, supposedly at home alone. Oh damn it, they weren't home alone. Invites yeah. the individual into the house. DVD. Um, is that because they sent him a DVD? Uh, In his discovery yeah. package. Well, yeah, he's yeah he's he's referring to that. Yeah, yeah. But he should, he should. But it's identified by as an exhibit. Uh, or 
it, more than just DVD. That could be anything. Yeah, exactly. It could be like a copy of Chicks with Dicks or something, you know. Um, after a few moments, the decoy leaves and the host of the show, NBC correspondent Chiss, oh, he actually calls him by the right name here, calls him Chiss Hansen in another document. Chris Hansen appears. Hansen confronts the individual and starts asking questions such as, why are you here? <laughs> Such as why are you here? Yeah, that's a pretty fucking good question. It it's, is. It's a great it, yeah, question. it is a great question. <laughs> In some instances, yeah, the individual question. immediately tries to run out of the house. Surprisingly, however, hang, hang on a minute. Has Lauren wrote this? I don't think that because it, it's not a kind of twisted version. This is the everything that's being written here is kind of the truth. It's written quite well. It's it's pretty articulate. Surprisingly, however, in many inst instances, the individual answers Hansen's questions like Lorne did and allows himself to be interviewed by Hansen, who is armed, armed with a transcript. It's like it's a <laughs> weapon. <laughs> Even the way he's reciting the facts, it doesn't look good for him. No, it doesn't at all. That's why I'm surprised. It's like when we were no. reading the earlier paragraphs, it was all twisted, you know, slime, persuasive chat, cunning female decoy. That was, I fucking love that. Cunning female decoy. Um, it is apparent that the host of these individual. What? Oh, sorry. It is apparent that most of these individuals believe that Hansen, who does not identify himself at first, is a police officer or the father of the decoy. Okay. Um, at some point, Hansen will announce, "I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline." Okay. What's the point of this? He's just saying. I don't know. It doesn't. <laughs> It's funny how he gets in the mind of every other predator too. Like everyone thought he was either the father or a cop. You know, some people realized who he was. Yeah. Well, I think he's pointing that out to say um, it was somehow dishonest or like dishonorable for Chris Hansen to interview them without first identifying himself. Yeah, I think that's what he's getting them. to, isn't it? That's he does, yeah. he does mention that. Of course, Shin, right. Hey. That's on that. It, absolutely. Just because you assumed he was someone else and you answered his questions, you know, you can't blame him for that, which, of course, Lorna's trying to do. Yeah, I think he does go into detail about that. Upon exiting the house, the men are arrested by police. Several police officers display guns, forced the men to the ground face down and then handcuff them. The men are taken to the police station where they are processed, photographed and interviewed by a police officer and they eventually arra arra arraigned. Arraigned. Yeah. Arraigned in court. Um, guilty. guilty. But I, I mean, like I said, it's an accurate description of what's gone on apart from the um, kind of this armed with the transcript, which was quite comical. Um all these events, the arrival at the Stingos, the initial entry of the house, the first meeting with the decoy, the conversation, and blah, 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 are captured on camera with video and sound equipment, including hidden cameras provided by NBC. It is apparent that NBC commits substantial resources to the show. Yeah, okay. So what? Yeah, well, I, that's what I mean. I mean, I don't know whether he's building up to something. In the tw in, in the February 20th episode, for example, a large house was used. The police were staked out in a U-Haul truck parked... On the adjacent property, there were shots taken from numerous angles, both inside and outside the house. There is equipment to allow nighttime filming. There is equipment to monitor and record online chats and telephone conversations. In one shot, Anson is, stand is standing in front of perhaps eight television monitors. And there are many individuals involved, including perverted justice personnel, actors, police officers, NBC cast and crew. Well, no, there isn't any NBC cast. It's just... It's, where were they on February twentieth? Where, where, where was that thing? Don't I don't know whether someone in the chat can 2007. check that out. Um, it might be difficult to actually find out when it was filmed to increase ratings. Now we might start to get interested. Yeah. Dateline seeks to sensationalize and enhance the entertainment value of the confrontations, and according and accordingly. It encourages the police officers to give a special intensity to any rest so as to enhance the camera effect. I don't think that that's true. No, I mean, it's just a... I mean, it might, it's edited a certain way. They use, they use, they use music. If, well, you don't have to. These guys provide the, uh, the whole entertainment. You don't have to... There's nothing you need to sensationalise. It's already sensational. 
Indeed, the mainstay of the show is public humiliation of the individuals who are lured to the sting host by the promise of sex with a minor. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of... But I, I, think, I think that's really telling, too, that that's Lauren's main takeaway. The, the mainstay of the show is that our kids are not safe. Because these guys who you'll stand behind in a grocery store and think are just normal people mm-hmm. are coming to strangers' houses to try to have sex with their kids. That, right. that was the mainstay of the show. Public humiliation goes along it's with committing the crime. Of, isn't it? Exactly. But I would agree with one, from a perspective, what he's saying I believe is true, in that the one thing that stands out in To Catch a Predator is watching these guys get humiliated we get a perverse pleasure from it but mm-hmm. we we don't feel bad because of what they try to do it's it's that's why it's a unique show and a unique situation and and the humiliation is justified at the end of the day it's 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 a pointless argue what he's getting at here he's saying that you i mean let's carry on before i start making assumptions because i don't remember um, well, can I say something real quick? Uh, what's interesting is as he recounts these facts, which are objective, it, it doesn't really have one argument or the other on each side. It's just this is what happened. What's interesting is he doesn't insert anything about uh, Dogmaster brought it up, uh, whereas about the chat log being doctored, maybe the film being edited to make him look worse, uh, uh, that uh, he said no. Uh, you know, all these things he's saying now is not in this civil, is not in this criminal appeal. You know, there's no mac and cheese in here. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. If there's a whole paragraph on uh, um, petitioner went to his siblings' house to conduct uh, several hundred pounds worth of work at the promise of meatballs, he was denied these yeah. meatballs. <laughs> you know, that would be so funny. Um, uh, it, we, we, Clobbering Times mentioned it, and we did touch upon it in the last bit. It says, by the promise of sex, it's almost it's written in a way where it's like it's he's almost as an admission. It's he's yeah. almost criticizing them for promising them for promising him sex, which he didn't get. <laughs> yeah, not carrying through. You promise. <laughs> well, what he said, he's saying is, I'm one of those guys who, who was promised sex by a minor. Good pickup, Clover. I mean, that, that's exactly what he's saying. That, that's not, as I said, these, even these these facts, as they're recited objectively, they make them look terrible. Mm-hmm. Especially for a guy who says that he would never have done it. He was he was never going to engage in sex with a thirteen year old. Yeah. And he admits here that he went there. He was lured there with the promise of sex. Yeah. Well, so, so what that implicitly says is. I went there because she promised me sex. Yeah, that's right, it's exactly. an admission. Exactly. It, it, it's the old. It's the same thing that Lauren well, does. He always drops himself in it with everything that he says and does unintentionally. Yeah, it was a bait and switch. That's what Sean French said. It's, <laughs> it should be a consumer protection case. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a criminal case. I mean, oh, oh, ironically, Lorne unintentionally travelled to jail because he didn't really want to go there, did he? He never meant to go to jail, but he ended up going. So you could say that that was unintentional travel. Yeah, that's true. Um, in producing To Catch a Predator, Dateline provides equipment, money, services, and other things of value to local police departments. Okay, in return, law enforcement mm-hmm. agrees to participate. Permits Dateline to videotape arrest. Dramatically staged scenarios. They're not dramatically staged scenarios, are they? What you know? No, what what would be a, drama- a dramatically staged scenario? Would be that stage where things are put in place that wouldn't normally be there for the effect of the camera. That's not. That's yeah. not what happens at all. He doesn't understand what words mean. He he's an idiot. <laughs> but I think what he's referring to is when. He walked out the door, and they screamed, Sheriff's office, down, get down! They pointed their guns at him. He he brought up to somebody he was talking to, I can't remember which woman, but he was screaming and crying about how, in some of the things, the predators would just walk out the back door, and the police were just standing there, and they'd say, you know, put your hands up, put your hands behind your back. But for his arrest, they screamed at him, they all pointed guns at him, they, they frightened him, and yelled at him and made him cry 
Well, I think they, that's... they did point guns at him initially. And, and again, how many times do we have to say this, Amanda? He, he kept his hands concealed. Mm-hmm. And he was lying on the ground to tuck them under his face while he cried. Mm-hmm. And so until they see his hands, the guns are going to stay on him. <laughs> But in Lauren's mind, I know he's lucky he didn't get tased or shot. Oh, that would be so funny. Oh, but in God. his mind, he's not a bad... The cops should just know that he's not a dangerous person and that he never even wanted to do it. And they should have treated him much better than that. Because because the only you know offense he had on his record was a DUI. Yeah. yeah. Guys, we got to see outside footage at some point. Yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I did see a couple of people commenting on that the other the other day on that old video I did. Um, I think it was a re-upload because uh, Raptor Bacon has got my entire fucking back catalogue. I thought some of those videos had gone when my channel, the old channel oh. went. Every single video is on a hard drive somewhere, or, or, or sorry, not a hard drive, but like a Google Drive or something. I was like, wow. So that stupid video I did where I pretended to be that American dude. We're still on there, as well as the outside yeah. footage yeah. one. Uh, well, outside footage, seventy-five percent of the outside footage, you were laughing your ass off. I couldn't help it, dude. It was just <laughs> that's oh. what made me. Feel it's again. when his hat falls off. That's the killer for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's so like, oh, yeah, it's so meta. It's so like metaphorical, as like you know, it's so symbolic of. His dignity goes at the moment. You know, everything, you know, the hat was concealing his bald head that he's so ashamed of. He doesn't just embrace it like I have. He's like, no, I need my head on. You know, it's like, dude. Can you, can you hide by your face? I even did it. I think I did one of my first ever videos that I did right when I started doing these was about his hat and how him having his hat in place all the time it highlights his personality perfectly because he's like afraid to face up to the truth. And but once you yeah. take that plunge and you just accept it, things become a lot easier. Like I used to, when my hair first started falling out, or when it started receding, when I was in my like uh, late twenties, I immediately started shaving it to the bone. Like got a razor and did it. I was just like, right, just fucking do it now, so that when it does happen. No one will notice, and that's what happened. And now I look at pictures of myself with a full head of fur. Like you're like a twat, actually. You look, I look better than I actually look better now. But you can't do that. And still to this day, he's always got to have his hat on. His like you'd think after all this time, he'd get used to it, wouldn't you? Yeah, you know the the interrogation video uh, where he was uh, with uh, Gillingham uh, when he asked if he had uh, Gillingham asked if he had his ID with him and. Lauren said, it's in my wallet. You guys have it. And then the uh, Gillingham's partner walked over to the evidence table. Uh, I cracked up so hard. I do every time uh, the guy picks up and there's his hat in that uh, cellophane evidence bag. (laughs) I didn't see that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, check it out. It's funny. Oh, will do. (laughs) So funny. Um that's brilliant. In return, law enforcement agrees to participate in the show, permits Dateline to video to... Oh, right, we've, I've done that. Um, Dateline has produced Predator segments in... You both still there, guys? Yeah, that was yeah. me, sir. Oh, it's all right. Uh, Dateline has produced Predator segments in, among other places, Riverside County, California... Yeah, okay, right, and... In the fall of 2006... Oh, right, here was going to mention the uh, district attorney. Uh, Why does he give us production history, history here? I don't know, dude. I, I don't know. It's like, is he just bored? Has he just got he's just rabbiting going on and on? Dateline decided to do a segment of to catch a predator in Murphy. Um, over the course of five days, 24 men were arrested to go to the Murphy house. Um, police officers come to inside the Sting house. Eventually, all of the charges were dropped as the local district attorney found that none of the cases could be prosecuted. Conrad versus NBC Inc. Contrary to the Murphy operation, Petitioner Armstrong <laughs> visited a sting house in Kentucky where he was apprehended, prosecuted and sanctioned with prison time. Seven years in a state prison and five in a federal. Considering the local district attorney in Murphy dropped their charges on the men who visited a sting house in Murphy, Petitioner Armstrong has had to suffer an... What's that say? 
egregious miscarriage of justice. <laughs> yeah, in a way, he has an argument here. I mean, yeah. Well, each state is different, but for instance, if you you know if you look at all these uh, Riverside guys, they got the Long Beach special. Basically, nobody saw jail time. It must burn his ass to know that, you know. Um, but then again, he should check out what they did in Georgia. You know, I think Georgia and Kentucky were the toughest ones. I think Florida was was behind that. But the California things were really just a slap on the wrist for these. They got put on RSO and all this other stuff, but they didn't do. They didn't. But then again, he had federal charges in addition to state charges. So uh, you know, he, I can imagine how that. that uh, yeah, that I I I never thought I'd hear myself say this, but I understand what Lon's getting at here. If that was me. I'd be pretty pissed off. It's like other people got away with it for exactly the same thing, and I got five years. You'd be pretty. You'd, that would infuel your rage. So that that will just piss. If you're someone who can't take responsibility for your actions, that will make things ten times worse because you'll just go, "Well, they got away with it. I want to get away with it too." You know. And that's Lauren's personality to a T. Exactly. So well, they do it. Why can't I? Yeah. But does he have any... What he's saying here is that the Fifth Amendment, no person should be deprived of his life liberty without due process of law. Now, he was deprived of that. But with what he's saying is because well, other people got away well, with it, it's without due process of law. That doesn't make sense to me. Process. He got he got to read his rights at his interrogation. Uh, he got incarcerated. He got bail. He, uh, he couldn't make it. He stayed in jail. Uh, the evidence was overwhelming, and he pled out. And then during the colloquy, the judge made sure he understood all his constitutional rights and that he was waiving that. And uh, so I'm not exactly sure where due process was. No, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense with regard to what he's just kind of gone off on a limb, though, hasn't he? And go, oh, yeah, they he's... violated my Fifth Amendment. No, they haven't. Yes, he's just an idiot, and he doesn't understand what words mean. Yeah. He gives them his own meaning. And he <laughs> it's sees, quite convenient. He, yeah, well, he said he sees that he was deprived of his his life, liberty, and property by being locked up. And the, the rest of it kind of just, just ignore that part, that his rights were violated. He also said, I mean, it's going on further, but I know he says something about, like, his privacy was was invaded because they filmed him while committing a crime. Just oh, stuff that uh, makes no sense. The other Fifth Amendment issue would be self-incrimination. That's the other one. Uh, he was more than glad to talk to these guys. I mean, he was read his rights. He uh, signed off on his rights, and then he signed off on a waiver to talk. So that's the only really part where the Fifth Amendment comes in here. And, and in terms of due process, uh, it would apply in the federal case, but due process for state cases is the 14th Amendment. So, this is interesting here. The Western District of Kentucky State Attorneys and their assistants who orchestrated the above sting must be held accountable. Accountable for what? These well, government well, attorneys allowed NBC to broadcast Petitioner Armstrong's apprehension and arrest. Well, I, I don't. What? 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 What is the point? He's just stated that other people got off with it in another state. So therefore, he's now saying. Because of that, 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 yeah. that yeah. it doesn't make any sense that he's app- allowed NBC to broadcast Petitioner Emerson's apprehension and arrest. Well, of course. Well, he explains in the next line why that. Would you prefer, would you like to read on Amanda? Sure. Um, this exposure violated Petitioner's right to fair and impartial judgment as he was exposed to the public before he was indicted, and he had begun his court proceedings. Interesting. Well, yeah. I mean, that is always an issue, you know, in terms of uh, uh, pretrial publicity and whether a jury is going to be biased or not. Um, was it? Sorry um, to interrupt, dude. Just yeah. to clarify, it was broadcast before his trial, wasn't it? Or was it? It was broadcast in February, but he put out, I think, in May. Because he so, watched, it was in jail. It was broadcast when he was in jail. So, correct. Was it broadcast before he pled? Was it broadcast before? Yes. Right. It was, it, again, the timeline, as far as I remember it, it was broadcast in February or March of 2008, and he pled out, 
I think in May and June. So, you know. So do, but, does he have a point? No, no. I mean, he, he, he created a newsworthy event, you know, of, of course. I mean, people aren't going to hide arrests. I mean, uh, that's part of what the police need to do is to, you know, be transparent about things and show things. And especially in this a case like this, where you have an alleged child predator, they want it, They want his face out there. You know, it could be other people that, you know, other victims that come forward or, or, or whatever. But either way, you know, there's no way that anyone could avoid criminal prosecution because their arrest was so public. You know, the, the worst that could happen is they change venues. Right. Would, but that's it. Nobody avoids criminal prosecution. But yeah, we just, talked about that before. It's like with with any really high profile case. um, the yeah. media is going to cover it. I, you know, look at like Casey Anthony and stuff. Every news outlet was was talking about that. Lauren acts like everybody in the world sought to catch a predator. Yeah, and, and you, it would have been impossible to find a, a you know an impartial jury, which is well, not the best true. Do it situations, the attorneys get a little more latitude and voir dire. You know, when they speak to each individual. Uh, jurors, are you able to render a fair and impartial verdict, notwithstanding the fact that you know about this case? You know, and they take it even further. They look into their backgrounds. They have these questionnaires and everything else. And sometimes you could have 200 people show up in the courthouse to uh, as jurors, and you end up running through all of them and only impaneling three, and then you have to get another group in. They'll find people. So, But he never had a jury, so I don't know what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> this is a good point. This is a very good point. He didn't have a jury and he pled guilty. Um, I'm trying to like, right. I'm trying to be impartial because I'm trying, there's no point just, I mean, we can have a laugh at this when something's funny, we can have a laugh, but I want to take it, I want to at least try and figure out what was going on in his mind. So I don't want to dismiss everything he's saying completely out of hand and trying to, because there is a motivation behind him writing these words, you know, it's, it's not just a monkey arm with a typewriter. Although you could make that comparison, um, so he, like I said, I understand what he's trying to say, but like you, very, I think I like the way what what you said, Chin, and I've not really heard it like that before. He created a newsworthy story when O.J. Simpson allegedly right. murdered his wife. It was on the fucking news. You, you know, what was is, hmm. did he did, it, did his legal team make that claim that they that the well, yeah, news. They, they tried to get it out of Brentwood County, which is, I guess, a uh, much more conservative, uh, whiter. And eventually they moved to L.A. County. And the reason why they did that, apparently, I think Garcetti made the decision that he needed to accommodate all the press. And that was a big mistake because the jury uh, uh, composition in that area uh, favored O.J. in that case. They, that's where, A lot of people think that that's where they lost the case when they changed venue. And they didn't really have to because it was the news. The news was the news everywhere, especially uh, surrounding Los Angeles. What they're saying would make sense in some cases. Let's say someone, you know, some. But but court cases are set up in a way. At least they're, they're supposed to be in a way which stops any kind of prejudgment. Obviously, it's been if it's headline news across the world you're going to be struggling. But with something like this, like you said, Amanda James, not everybody's seen it. You're going to be able to very easily find 12 jurors that have probably never seen it before. But he's, he's clinging on to anything that he can and trying to use it to his advantage, isn't he, basically, and saying, you know, how dare they broadcast mm -hmm. it before a trial? You've ruined any chance I had of, of a fair trial, and that's why I pled guilty, because I was doomed. And now after I've pled guilty, I'm going to try and sue you, basically. <laughs> Well, again, he's got no jury here. Uh, but typically, you got to remember that the impartiality aspect of the jury is constantly scrutinized, even through appeals. So if they found out that a jury juror uh, improperly considered evidence that wasn't part of the record, uh, things like that, that's where you can that's where you can get an appeal. I mean, so anytime you find somebody a juror who's impartial is 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 going to be in a you know. A harmful uh, 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 defect in the uh, in the proceeding. They would remand it back, but 
but he never had a jury, so this is all nonsense. It doesn't matter. Yeah, but, but like I said, though, Shane, he could argue that he pled guilty because, I mean, he doesn't, but he could argue he pled guilty because he knew he didn't have a chance. Which you could, you know, if, in, in a certain scenario, you could imagine that happening, you know, through some case somewhere, couldn't you? Yeah, but again, he didn't have a chance because of the way the evidence stacked up against him, and that's what his lawyer probably convinced him. And of course, they they really jammed him up with the child porn attempted child porn charge too. Um, so, I mean, this is just normal stuff. This he expands not- on it a little bit here. While the news media are entitled to receive, investigate, report on all public proceedings involved in a trial, the right to gather uh, the right to gather news, much like other First Amendment rights, is not absolute. It does not guarantee journalists access to source of information not available to the public generally, such as persistence Armstrong's apprehension and arrest. So he's saying they shouldn't be allowed to use what the footage. But I don't understand. I don't understand what he's getting at here. Well, it's nothing. It means nothing. Of course, there's no absolute right for a journalist to get a camera. Look at federal court. You can't bring a camera in there. I mean, I again, I. It's apropos to nothing. Hmm. A trial court may refuse to allow the media to inspect documents not of a not a matter of public record, including jurors' names. What, what I don't understand. Well, unfortunately, unfortunately for Lauren, the media was involved in this arrest. It's not like. I, I don't understand what he's trying to say, that the media doesn't have the right to this footage, but they were, I, maybe that's what he's trying to say, is that they, they should have never been there to begin with. The camera shouldn't have been there. The media shouldn't have been there. I don't know why. I, I mean, if there was no cameras, there'd have been no sting operation. He'd have never got caught. It's probably what he means deep down. He's like, do they catch me? Or... I mean, he said before to, to I think it was Ramona, um, that sting operations are fine, but they should be performed by the police, not groups like Perverted Justice, and Dateline NBC should not be involved because they just did it for money and ratings. Which, again, I don't know why that matters. Even if they did do it for, for money and ra- I mean, of course they did. It's a TV show. Of course they did, but I don't know why their intentions or their motivation changes the fact that these men committed crimes on camera. He's just complaining that he's been humiliated. He's just trying to find some legal loopholes that would absolve him of any, you know, kind of responsibility to endure it, really. I think that's the point. Yeah, I, I think that's what pisses him off more than anything is that it was televised and that people, you know, got to witness his shame and humiliation. He even said at one point um, that they should never have been allowed to to release the footage um, worldwide. It should have only been allowed on local news. Why? I don't know. This is the feel of his humiliation. You're right. Hmm. It is just, um, similarly though. Um, the media generally have a right to publish information that they obtain. Neither the First Amendment nor the Fourteenth Amendment mandates a right of access to government information or source. I mean, what, what's, I don't. Know. And it's a right of access to government information or source of information within the government's control. He's talking about reciprocal discovery there or something. I don't know what he's talking. There's some lawyers in the chat. Anybody know what this is? I mean, we are trying to make sense of someone who not only a few paragraphs ago put fucking female powers in, so <laughs> maybe we're uh, giving him too much respect at this point. Uh, Petitioner Armstrong's right to the First and Fourteenth Amendment were violated when all the circumstances of his arrest were publicised before his court proceedings, right? which is what he pointed to earlier. Considering Armstrong has clearly demonstrated several of his constitutional rights have been violated by the government he qualifies to be granted relief I, his conviction should be overturned <laughs> just, what's funny is he builds up to it and builds up to it and he goes I want my guilty plea overturned 
So he thinks that uh, that grooming a child, he, he, he alleges that his First Amendment rights were violated by government intrusion. So he thinks that's, that grooming a child is protected speech. That's interesting. interesting it's almost like he's like, yeah, okay, I did something kind of wrong. What I did was a little bit wrong. But what you guys did was really wrong. So you should let me out on a technicality. And my crime is canceled out because you violated my constitutional rights. I suppose you can't blame him for trying, can you? I mean, you know, I'm sure that given the chance, anybody would... Uh, I mean, the doctor, the the research doctor, is he dead now? Maurice Woolham? I don't know. I think, I'm, I'm sure pretty sure that. he is. I, I clicked a link, but it was a, that was provided for that information, that news, and, and it wasn't him. Was another guy, but Joey would know. Joey's the uh, Joey's the archivist of uh, of all the stuff. Um, have you? Klopp has just said that Long got brought up. Has anybody seen those Chris Chan documentaries that Joe Samuels has done, which they're really good? Um, this guy um, does short documentaries on Chris Chan. There's loads of them. Loads of them, very, very popular on the internet. I think they've had like tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of views, and Lawn's mentioned in one, Club has just said. So. Nice. Nice. So uh, we'll, have to, we'll definitely have to check that out. I don't find Chris Chan anywhere near as interesting as Lawn, but, no. I, but I do no. understand... The, there are some parallels with the Lawn case, um, especially he he was bullied... And didn't deserve it. You, you, you know, Lawn, you, you're struggling to make a case with Lawn because of what he tried to do, even though I have my, you know, <laughs> massive reservations with regards to the catfishing. You, you know, you're fighting an uphill battle with this guy, which is why my uh, most people disagree with me. <laughs> um, Amy says he dead. He is dead. So. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, you're not going to get... Yeah, but, yeah I think... Sorry, the, what I was trying to yeah. get at was that he... Plot, as I understand it, that doctor spent a lot of money trying to fight his case. He would have definitely gone down that road of all this shit that Lawn's coming out with now about the cameras being there and it interrupted a fair trial and entrapment. They must have tried, I believe... I read somewhere that he tried everything. Like, he threw everything at it. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, Lauren actually had... A a better opportunity for a defense than, than Wolland did. I mean, we, we've talked about this before, too. I, the best hope that Lauren had was competency. He wasn't competent to stand trial. He, wasn't, he, 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 did, he didn't understand what he was doing. And also inebriation, you know, using that. Those were, would have been his best defenses. I mean, I would have just said, look, Lauren, just sit there and drool. Let, just let me do this, okay? <laughs> Don't do anything else. Um, and, and, and anybody who read the chat log would agree to, you know, this guy's fucking crazy. Yeah. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't get really anything wrong. Well, that's part of his issue. That's part of his, his, uh, whatever he's suffering from. And that would have been his best hope. Jim Roush too, by the way, he would have made a, his intoxication, would have, I think would have made a decent defense. I mean, I, I must admit, I do kind of. I, I, I can't use the word admire and lawn, it's just wrong, but there is something that I see that is mm, not complete um, disgust in that he's built all this up and said that he's trying to put a case forward that his constitutional rights were violated, so therefore, because like read it, in order to he cited a stated case, this Gleason versus the, the states. In order to obtain relief from an entrapment claim, a petition. Well, you know, he doesn't lead up to it. He just. Well, I don't know. He's, he's kind of. No, he doesn't lead up to that case, but he's, he's led up to this point oh, here okay. about his constitutional rights being violated, and then he states this case where. It says an existence of error of constitutional magnitude that has a substantial and injurious effect on our influence on the plea. So he's saying what I said earlier that he pled guilty because he had no choice, but his constitutional rights were violated. But of course, we know that they weren't. And he, even he does, really, ironically. <laughs> um, oh, here we are. Do you want to, one of you guys? Do you want to read this? <clears throat> Go, Amanda, please. Okay. 
Um, whether circumstances surrounding petitioner's plea agreement were sufficient to create a miscarriage of justice. Circumstances surrounding petitioner's guilty plea were so egregious that his plea was involuntary, unknowing, and unintelligent. If you got Scenari- that right. <laughs> Scenarios that created such a guilty plea include, but not limited to, Pre-trial publicity, not receiving all the government's exculpatory evidence, his Miranda rights, his, oh, he's just pulling everything out now, his state of mind when he decided to visit this, oh my God, his state of mind when he decided to visit the sting house. You're surprised, are you? I'm always surprised. I shouldn't be, but his stupidity always surprises me. Or just his nerve. Most people wouldn't say this. Right, the audacity, you know. Um, Let's see. His state of mind. His psyche when NBC aired to catch a predator. Now with him as the predator, etc. This set of circumstances... This set of circumstances violated petitioner's constitutional rights, which in turn created a miscarriage of justice. And pre-trial publicity, before p- Petitioner pled guilty, NBC aired to catch a predator show in which he was the predator. Okay. With such <laughs> publicity, <You said> <laughs> with such publicity, uh, Petitioner never would have received a fair trial. Jurors would have him guilty before the tri- trial commenced. Had the court and government prevented the airing of the show until after Petitioner pled guilty or when a trial ended, the fairness of his trial would have been preserved. While certain aspects of pre-trial hearings weigh heavily in favor of implementing protective procedures to safeguard defendants' right to a fair trial, necessity and scope of such procedures must be balanced against interest of press and public in open judicial proceedings. Court must find that there is likelihood that pretrial publicity will jeopardize defendants' fair trial and that there are no alternative means reasonably available by which fairness of trial might be reserved without interfering with public's interest in open proceedings before proceedings may be closed. That was a mouthful. Mm Mm-hmm. So he's just babbling on about how they shouldn't have aired the show until after his trial. Yeah, he's going on. There's no point reading this verbatim. Uh, extensive pre-trial publicity, blah, 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 blah. He's just using stated cases here. Um, um, government's evidence. Under the Fifth Amendment, U.S. Supreme Court rulings and rules um, provide blah, 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 blah. Okay. Petitioner Armstrong. Oh. But he acknowledges. What do you think he acknowledges? Because I haven't read the rest of it. What's that? Um, Petitioner Armstrong acknowledges that he received his online chat conversation with the decoy and the DVDs of, DVDs of his arrest at the Stingos and his conversation with Anson Rat. Okay. However, Petitioner did not receive expulpatory. What does that word mean? Any evidence that makes you that makes him innocent. <laughs> <laughs> So he's, well, no, no, he's complaining no, no, that they didn't send him stuff, which gets him off the hook. To hand over exculpatory evidence, no matter what, that's mandatory. But so he's is... saying, sorry, it, it, he's saying they they hid the parts in the chat log where he said no. Basically, uh, they didn't hand over well, that that evidence. Say that. I mean, he's he's basically saying there's there's evidence that that will uh, that would acquit him. Uh, in the hands of the the government that they didn't hand over to his defense attorney. That's what he's saying. He's saying the the search of his truck and him being harassed. Um, and uh, whether Hanson with, had police authority to whoa, whoa, whoa. interrogate. NBC crew present and harassing petition. Did they harass him? He oh, means he by the camera in the face, doesn't he? That's what he's, that's what he's getting at. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. How much can a man bear? Um... Whether Hansen had police authority to interrogate Petitioner, that makes no sense because we all know that it, 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 you don't need police authority to have a conversation with anybody. This is what Lorne doesn't grasp or doesn't want to. All that Chris Hansen was doing, was doing, there was no legal play 
going on there. He was sat in a room talking to a man. If Lorne thought he was under arrest, or that's his problem, isn't it? As you, I think you pointed to that, Amanda James, at the beginning. Right, and Chris never pretended to be a police officer. He never tried to give that impression. He simply asked the predators to sit down and talk to him about it. Yeah, and 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 sometimes the 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 way he, if you were to argue that Chris acted like a police officer at any time, it would be the times where he told people to take their hands out of their pockets. Mm -hmm. That, probably, but he didn't do that with Lauren. So, Lauren, Lauren had nothing in his pockets. Um, in Bradley and Bigley, the Supreme Court held that due process under the Fifth Amendment requires the prosecution to disclose favourable evidence to the accused. Oh, uh... There is none. Sorry. I mean, what did he expect that, what did he think that the prosecutor had in his file that would exonerate him? He's probably he's probably just like one of these. You know, if I if I just come out with this, some med evidence will magically appear and I'll get off the hook. It's just crazy. Like he thinks he's in Harry Potter land or something. Um, right, he's just rambling here. He really is rambling. Um, oh, I'm gone. Uh, it's required to disclose Armstrong's statements of substance of any relevant oral statement made at the time of petitioner's arrest. Must be disclosed and made available. What? Yeah, but he's not but saying is... what. He's not saying he's not. He, he's not pointing to a fact, not dicta, not from a law, but he's not a fact in his case where he says the prosecutor withheld exculpatory evidence. He's not saying that. He's saying they can't do that, but he's not saying they did it here. They, oh well, he's saying that blanket, just just a conclusory, you know, statement. That's it. But he's not saying this is what they specifically what they did not give my. Defense attorney. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. I mean, I mean, you have to say that. Sorry. Fucking weird. Um, okay, so he's just he just witness statements. Yeah, Miranda rights. When petitioner arrived at the Stingo, oh, this. Um, do, do you mind doing so again, Amanda? We love listening to your voice. You sound so yeah. sweet. <laughs> When Petitioner arrived at the Sting House, he was confronted by NBC's decoy. Then he spoke to her, but most of his conversation was with Hansen. Mr. Hansen did not identify himself as a police officer or as one who was working with any law enforcement agent. Okay, right, he didn't. Also, mm -hmm. Hansen did not read the Miranda rights to Petitioner. He thinks he's like it was a police interview, doesn't he? Right. Why would Chris Hansen have to read the Miranda rights? To him. Especially he's not... saying he wasn't identified as a police officer. He thinks that that conversation is like is pl is police evidence. So I think, well, throw it out, throw it out. That's what I say. You know, okay. Mm -hmm. you got a problem with it? Throw the throw the interview out. Let's just talk about your phone calls and the chat log out. Yeah, exactly. That's what you'd do if you'd have brought this up before. You'd have just gone see that. I'm setting fire well, to it. I, no problem. Yeah. You know, I don't even think that the prosecutor needed this. Maybe they wouldn't even presented it. Um, but, you know, what did he say at his interview? He said uh, it was supposed to be 13. Okay, I got that. But he got Gillingham got that out of him. Um, he talked about Amanda James. He, Amanda did, James, he did admit that he was going to sleep with her in the chat. Uh, yeah, it, well, again, we're, we're limiting it to what he told Chris. He no, said he, that he, he, said, he, he said that's Chris because... Chris said, "Lauren, you you you, you wore um, your broad condoms. You had an explicit conversation, and, he, know. and then he goes That's exactly. So that at that yeah. point, that was an admission. So he goes, what does that add up to? He exactly. didn't say, right? What does that up to? He said, you know, I know. It's really nothing what Chris did in terms of evidence against them. But Lauren yeah. twists it in his mind to think that that." conversation had bearing on his case because basically what he's pissed off at is the fact that he coughed his you know he spilled his guts in front of Chris Hansen and basically said what he was there for and now he's trying to say that they shouldn't have done that that it was you know unconstitutional he's just trying every trick in the book isn't he and this is why all of this I mean we had the this is a little bit not quite as humorous as what we read last week because you've got no female powers and sly and cunning decoy but this is what angers people so much that it's every 
possible avenue he could possibly think of. He's left no stone unturned when it comes to avoiding responsibility, when it comes to blaming someone else. Every single entity that's been involved from start to finish in getting him prosecuted is to blame except him. Everybody. In abundance. You know, Chris Hansen, the police, perverted justice, the government, the fucking cameramen. You know, I'm sure the cleaner had a he had a problem with a cleaner at some point. You know, literally, that's why it pissed people off so much, and that's why, ironically, he got so much shit. It's karma, isn't it? You know. I mean, you it, know, the more I think about it, 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 you know, the Chris Hansen interview could have been made into a better legal argument. You know, uh, where the where the, he was working hand in hand with the police, they call him a, a you know a, a quasi uh, state official in that situation because they're recording everything. And like Ford says here, you know, after Chris was done with him, the cops would take him into custody. And that would, that actually is legally when he was in custody. But you can make an argument that, uh, you know, again, Chris uh, did violate his uh, uh, Fifth Amendment right to probation and everything else. But again, throw it out. Let's see where we. There's plenty. Of, there's plenty of evidence left. This is interesting. Here, read this bit. Right. Therefore, petitioner provided um, Hansen with what transpired on in in his chat room conversation and why he travelled to the Stingo. So, in other words, what he's saying is, Lon told Chris Hansen what he was there for to fuck a child. Um, yeah, he while, confessed. Yeah, exactly. Why petition? While petitioner was talking with Hansen, he had no reason to believe he was in custody. But unbeknown to him, he was in custody. So he believed at that point he was under police jurisdiction and, pl- and, and Hanson was acting as a police agent. He's, but that, but that's not true. I mean... You can make an argument. Of that. But, but again, merely just throw out Chris Hanson's interview from getting uh, entered into evidence. Mm-hmm. Petitioner's conversation with Hanson must be considered a confession of petitioner's over acts. I don't understand what that means. He's basically saying that, you know, he spilled his guts to Chris, but he really didn't. I don't think he, he didn't. Did. Yeah. He really didn't. He made a bunch of excuses. Right. I've spent years but getting he, he taken did, advantage he of. He did. Like I he said, though, there was a confession bad. when he said it. I know. You know. Yeah, well, he agreed it looked bad. That's what he He didn't say I came over to rape a child. I mean, it's it's... That's all it is, and 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 the other close closer admission would be, you were going to marry her. Well, I was going to wait. <laughs> You're going to have sex until she was, you know. And, and he denied that. He actually, I think, mm-hmm. he said, oh. and so there was no admissions here. Well, he says right here, this type of confession cannot be used in any future court proceedings. It wasn't used in the court proceedings. <laughs> he said, he said <laughs> guilty. <laughs> arguments that uh he's making search and seizure arguments fourth amendment arguments that you would make prior to trial or a motion limiting prior to trial but he wasn't even close to going to trial he didn't he hadn't even discussed uh, my guess is they hadn't even got out of the discovery aspect of the case so you don't know what the state would have handed over yet mm-hmm. he pled out before they were geared up for trial and they were going to they were going to indict him again they were going to uh, do a superseding indictment for the child porn if he didn't take that plea. So they would have gone back in front of the grand jury, and then the process would have started all over again. Petitioner P- P- acknowledges that Miranda rights are only available to those who are in custody and then being interrogated. He qualifies for both custody is the deprivation of freedom. Thanks for spelling that out, Lauren. A suspect is in custody if a reasonable person would not feel free to end the case or leave. Uh, Chris tells them, you're free to leave. Chris tells all the guys you're free yeah. to leave. Of course, they're apprehended at the door, but Chris isn't holding yeah. them in, in Yeah, custody. he doesn't even need to say that because he's only saying that because they think that they are somehow being held there. They think, most of them think that Chris is a, is a detective. You know, but Lauren you... admitted that he didn't think Chris was a police officer. He thought he was Dr. Moore. <laughs> You know, his argument would be str- uh, stronger if uh, if the uh, the process that Chris used for his later stings would be when the guy's already hooked up and Chris comes into the hotel room to talk to him. 
That's that's a different situation. He's in custody then. This is interesting. What he says here, without a doubt, Petitioner was in custody. He was not free to leave. So what he's saying is because he basically wasn't getting out of that house free, that his right to freedom ended the minute he stepped in front of that in yeah, that yeah, house. Yeah. No, it's got a, it, it's a, it's a reasonable uh, individual assessment at that time. If he got up to leave, which we never know, which we never knew, uh, and actually, at the very end, when Chris says you're free to go, if you got nothing else to say, that 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 does it right there. But what he's trying to do is he's trying to throw in the whole global process that the cops were waiting for him outside. So his leaving was just illusory. It wasn't. He didn't really. But it didn't matter. It's what. The time, uh, what spending time in front of Chris is the operative period, not what happened to him afterwards. He's trying to throw it all together. Yeah. And getting nowhere, as usual. Oh, this is going to be really interesting. Sorry, Amanda Jones, we need your sweet, sweet voice to read this. Okay, petitioner's state of mind. As previously cited in this petition... The female decoy cunningly persuaded uh, Petitioner Armstrong to visit her at the Sting House against his better judgment. Let's just stop there, shall we, and just take in what he's just said. Cunningly. You've got to wonder how he cool. rearranged the conversation in his mind to fit this narrative. Because how can you? how can he even say Kayla cunningly persuaded him by when he said are you are you ready for me she said yes that mm -hmm. was her persuasion mm -hmm. he's the one who who wanted this he set it up he's the one who asked you know where she lived do you have woods around your house he persuaded her and, and True. i'm glad that he touches upon this because i thought he was going to write all this and not even mention his intent but he touches upon it. So this is really important. Petitioner's state of mind. And you couldn't get somebody more guilty, but yet he took it upon himself to explain. Even mention mens rea. You would think that someone in his position that mentions mens rea in that situation would just say, yeah, I'm guilty. I'm so, uh, That's what I meant to do. I was going to sleep yeah. with that kid. However, my constitutional rights were still violated. So fuck you and I'm getting off with it. Yeah. What is what is mens rea? What does that mean? Mens rea means intent, but but that's the thing. He he thinks that mens rea is what was actually going on in his mind, that nobody else could know but him. He does that all the time. He receives those dark places and says nobody can touch this. So mens rea in this case is written all over the chat log. That that's that's the evidence of his intent. Actus rea is the other part where you have to put the intent and the action together. And his actions speak for himself. He came to the place, he, 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 he could He could draw, he could draw um, a sort of opposition to that and say that, yeah, his mens rea was all over the chat, but what he could say and what he does say is that he, he never meant to go there, it was unintentional travel. When I got in the house, I wasn't going to do anything. You know... Um, there's no evidence. Oh, of course, of that. yeah. I mean, we know that. But um, anyway, should we? Uh, do you want to carry on? See if this gets any better, Amanda James. Uh, had yeah, petitioner gone. Um, sorry, I lost my screen. Oh, sorry. Have you got it? Um, no. Where did it go? Oh, I got it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, let's see. Where am I? Had petitioner, had petitioner gone to trial, he would have raised a mens rea argument. As defined by Black's Law Dictionary, mens rea is the mental state accompanying a forbidden act, usually a criminal act. At trial, mens rea is considered an affirmative defense. Again, again, it's, it's an element that the state has to prove. Yeah. That's that's in, that's the whole basis of a legal prosecution. Right. Prosecution, you you have to state what the act, the mens rea was. The right. actus rea is the the physical right. act. You could have the actus rea, but not the mens rea. If you don't have the mens rea, you usually not committed the offence. But here, he's he's saying, I don't know what he's saying. At trial, mens rea is considered an affirmative. He's saying that he would have used 
he would have argued he had a different intent. That's all he's saying. Right. That he never had intention. And whether it's an affirmative defense, not really. What he's really doing is he's cutting into the prosecutor's element. He's not adding something to it. He's just, uh, this is so stupid. <laughs> it was as we expected. Um, Although the government bears the burden of proving each of these statutory elements of the charged offense, including petitioner's intent to have sex with a minor, the burden of proving affirmative defenses is shifted to petitioner Armstrong. Yeah, affirmative defenses like entrapment and uh, competency, uh, you know, things that the prosecutor is not presenting, but you are presenting, uh, you're presenting evidence to mitigate or to uh, justify or to uh, uh, <laughs> this is this gets good here. <laughs> Petitioner would have included a duress factor in his mens rea argument, as defined by Black's Law Dictionary. Duress is an action by a person, in this case, the female decoy, which compels another, in this case, the petitioner, to do what he would not otherwise do. <laughs> Had Petitioner not been in such a vulnerable state of mind, he would not have succumbed to the female decoy's persuasion. That is, he, he's completely forgetting, it seems, that he's done this before. Yeah. You know, he should change the word uh, duress factor to horny factor. <laughs> and the thing is, everything that he's wrote is wrong. He was in such a vulnerable state of mind, he would not have succumbed to the female decoy's persuasion. Like we've, uh, like we don't need to keep reiterating the same thing. But there was zero persuasion. There wasn't even a mm -hmm. hint of it. She was so. I think she was the most dismissive decoy we've ever seen, mm -hmm. which is great because it doesn't give him a leg to stand on, and it makes the the this even more funny. Well, you know, to even bring it even more basic. Even if he didn't show up at the house, he committed crimes. He would have been picked up. I don't know what his appeal would have looked like in that situation, but you know, uh, you know, exposing a minor to pornography, uh, to his own images, uh, even well, maybe not the uh, uh, the attempted production of child pornography because he didn't show up at a camera, but uh, delinquency, uh, contributing to delinquency of a minor, all kinds of charges, uh, <laughs> luring, uh, internet, uh, didn't matter whether he showed up or not. This kiss is great. Evidence to support his duress, this his duress theory can be gleaned from his pre-trial psychological breakdown. Right? Is that an official thing? Did we get an actual psycholo psychological report, or is it just his fucking word? Petitioner was detained on such on the eighteenth. That's in a civil suit. That's where he yeah. Comes. Ah, right. Okay. EDS or something. Probably yeah, he was put on medication for it, right? Anybody That's can right. anybody can go to a, a, a doctor and say, I've got anxiety and depression and get medication. Um, when NBC... Well, reports, uh, you know, we're, we'll probably see them if we go, if we do a civil case. He basically, you know, the, uh, the therapist or whoever it was basically said he reported uncontrollable crime. He was afraid <laughs> people in the jail would know what he did. Uh, he was always afraid of that. They put him on Prozac and sent him home. It, it's literally what Judge Woodcock said. He's trying to make out that he's the victim of his own crime. Because yeah. he yeah. says he... Uh, um, yeah, like you said, he's just saying that other people have watched it. This incident, coupled with his sincere remorse for visiting the Stingos. His really? sincere remorse. Where did that come from? Yeah. I never heard him say sorry. Not even Chris or... But he can't either. have it both ways. He's kind of saying he wouldn't have done anything. So No, he's saying... True, he kind of isn't saying he wouldn't have done anything. What he's saying is the only reason he would have done something is because he was pl persuaded by the sly cunning decoy and he was in a vulnerable state of mind. But even and so, he still yes, got so sincere state remorse. The st state should be liable... For his remorse that caused his, uh, duress. That's wow. Just wow. Yeah, just wow. That that. that. Oh, Ellaville. Not uh, he was. He wasn't given. Oh, and Prozac. There it is. Yeah. Wow. Um, oh, petitioner adamantly asserts his duress was so severe 
His mind Adam. was in an irrational state during his plea. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, so because he committed the crime, right? This is funny, though. It's because he committed it, the crime. Crazy. It, it, it created psychological problems, and therefore he didn't know what he was doing when he fucking pled guilty. <laughs> Yeah, because he was caught committing a crime. He was under severe psychological duress and, and you know, needed medication for his depression and blah, 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 blah. That's all a natural consequence of committing a crime. That sucks. It sucks to be you in that situation. Right, and that's your own fault. So go fuck yourself, Tony. Or an involuntary plea. Or unintelligent, uh, uh, a non will But Shin, when you when you agree to a plea, doesn't the judge like spell it out very clearly Absolutely. for you and, and make you exactly? The judge says, "You realize if you plea, you're giving up these rights, these rights, these rights." And and he has to respond. It's 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 an interaction between the defendant and him. And then the judge right. makes the decision whether it's voluntary and willing at that point. Uh, and accepts the plea or doesn't accept the plea. Mm -hmm. um, but and not only that, one of the questions that the judge always asks is, "Are you are you happy with your attorney? Do you think he represented you to the best of, of his ability you know, or her ability, whatever it is?" Always asks about covers all of it: Sixth Amendment right, Fifth Amendment right, Fourth Amendment, everything. He says, "Do you understand waiving all that stuff?" And then he tells it. Sometimes they require an allocution where the defendant has to state exactly what he did. And remember that speech he gave? Um, apologizing to the oh, world. Do that I. Was, was... <laughs> Despite his oversight, he remains steadfast that his thinking was not sane. So he's saying, if you, right, without being patronizing, guys, if, if someone is not sane, what does that mean they are? Well, they're insane, of course. So Lorne is saying that he was insane. So he, he's just going. He's, <laughs> so I was insane because I tried to sleep with a child. It's not my fault. Well, That's kind of his whole defense. I was messed up at the time. You know, what does that mean? <laughs> that means I wasn't thinking clearly, sanely, rationally. So therefore, he. That's his entire defense. I was, I was crazy. <laughs> so funny. Oh my god! And blah blah blah. And he's stating um, that he could not have reasonably understood his lawyer's advice. <laughs> so he's saying that he had no reasonable recollect like ability to understand what was going on around him, and he's he was that messed up. It literally, oh, this is. How is that possible, though, when he says the, the reason he took the guilty plea was because they were threatening him with a much longer sentence with the the um, additional child pornography charges. And then he says he, he, he didn't have a reasonable understanding of the severity of the charges. So which, which is it? I don't know. He doesn't. Yeah, I, th I, I think yeah, but he doesn't know. We don't. We certainly don't know. Um, a court must conduct a competency hearing if the circumstances, such as Armstrong's irrational, irrational <laughs> behaviour, is demeanor at court hearings, and a prior medical opinion creates sufficient doubt about Armstrong. Whoa. He literally trapped. There's nothing. This guy. He, 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 I didn't think he would ever do that. He, that's where Shin would have gone with it. <laughs> yeah, that's where I would have gone. Stay with Drove. I never thought he would question his own competence. That would be good. Why does a lawyer? His lawyer should have sent him for a medical evaluation to some uh, uh, some paid psychiatrist to write what he wanted. It's his only chance here. But he actually was willing to put his own competence and sanity on the line. That's interesting. Do do insane people know that they're insane though? Well, that's some that's a, something a psychiatrist would would know, but but he never had his competence tested, and I'm wondering if uh, I, I think any judge I mean would would have allowed would have, you know again this is a public defender, so the judge has to allocate expense fees for his cases too for investigators things like that. He would have he would have gladly approved a um, 
a psychological uh, evaluation after reading the chat log. I would have convinced him. Really? But I didn't think he was willing to do that because you can't do that without the defendant. I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I I would think his chat log reading would prove that he he was competent. Well, he, competence, it's kind of a different term. Competence means that he understood what was going on and he could assist the defense in his defense. That's all it means. Oh, and I yeah. think he can't. It's, it's basically a post plea of insanity, isn't it? Plo a post trial, a post guilty plea. Yeah, but what, what will happen is a, a judge may rule somebody incompetent, but keep them in jail and have them evaluated at a later date and see if they're competent again. They'll keep doing that. Um, or put them in a mental facility, rather, excuse me. Stay in abeyance. It doesn't get them out of the charge. Upon completing his prison term, Armstrong will be serving a supervised release. Upon his... Um, Attend sex offender classes, and you'll be going to them for a long fucking time, Lorne. <laughs> Considering petitioner is seeking a reversal of his conviction in an instant rule, petition uh, is asking this court for a stay and abeyance to attend sex offender classes. So he doesn't want to oh. go. Oh. Oh. So he must have been out when he wrote this. Wow, he's getting. I'm surprised he's not asking to get taken off the RSO registry. Well, he tried to do that, didn't he? A later day, we were witness to um, petitioner's instant petition. He is raising new claims. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so first thing he's asking for is a stay from probation counseling. Got it. Okay. I've always had wondered what is he asking for in the end of this thing? So he wants a stay. So he wants to get out of prison and have his conviction overturned and just be a free man, have no probation, no sex offender well, treatment. Know. It can't really be overturned. It's a plea. They would just revoke revoke the plea and have him come back in. And Well, didn't he just say that? Go to trial. Didn't... Well, he's just asking for a stay, uh, I guess, while this is pending so that he doesn't have to go to rape class. Okay. I guess. Retain jurisdiction. Okay. Yeah, he's just asking for a stay. He's not asking for a reversal. He has clearly shown uh, cause and has meritous arguments. Clearly. Yeah. Um, oh, respectfully submitted, Lon Armstrong, pro se, June 22nd, 2012. Um,. He was, he was still inside then, wasn't he? Uh, what I don't was know. It? It's G G the twenty second of two thousand twelve. Well, I mean, what what month? June twenty second. No, he, he was just, in there. He didn't get out until close. To Christmas. He says right here, the petitioner is asking this court to overturn his conviction and set him free. What's not a conviction? Right. Well, back, you know. Right. I I understand the best he could hope for would would be to what revoke his plea and and have a trial. Overturn his conviction and set him free. Well, that's the only thing the court could do. I mean, he's arguing all these. He's he's putting all of this stuff as if he would be arguing it once he's back on the trial list at a motion to suppress or a motion to dismiss and everything else. He's trying to do it all in one batch on an appeal, which he, by the way, waived. But he, he says nothing about the reason he wants to revoke his plea. He's got to get that get past that step first to get back on the trial list to fight this thing like he wants to. And the reason why he, from what I remember, the reason why he is claiming that his, his, uh, his plea was not free and voluntary is because of ineffective assistance of counsel. And he says nothing about the lawyer doing anything wrong. See whether there's anything else worth uh, in order to appear legitimate in front of TV cameras. The owner and members of Burgess have gone to considerable effort to hide a number of very important facts from you, the viewing audience. <laughs> While it makes for compelling, exciting television, that will certainly assist and 
MSNBC in announcing their ratings. Truth behind perverted justice, real operation is considerably different than what they portray for the cameras. Considerably more terrifying to those who take the time. Oh God, this this guy just will not stop. He's fucking nonsense, will he? Oh wow, well, this is good. You can't believe everything you see on TV. Carry on. While they attempt to portray themselves as a legitimate watchdog group who works with police, the facts show a very different side to pervertedjustice.com, a side that includes harassing and terrorizing completely innocent people, allowing real potential predators to simply walk away, involvement in computer fraud and hacking, and very serious breaches of your right to privacy and the security of your personal information. Oh, this site, corruptedjustice.com, oh my God, this is what an idiot, exists to help expose the truth regarding this vigilante group. While we applaud pervertedjustice.com for working with police during their latest group media bust with Dateline, we will continue in our efforts until every single bust is handed over to legitimate law enforcement for resolution rather than by perverted justice's own vigilante volunteers. Now he's just going to go into trying to prove. Yeah. He's... Oh. Xavier. There he is. Xavier, the devil. Xavier von Erk. Questions of uh, actual predators. Yeah, we could we could go into this. I think you get the gist of it, guys. Is is yeah. this? We, we've I think we've seen the highlights. We've seen the. Um, Let's see if we can pick out a few. Um... I wonder once he saw, once he filed this, thing, uh, whether he was totally confident that he was going to be sprung free, and may have been, uh, you know, telling his cellmates and everything else. Well, you got to get used to a new bunkie now. I'm going to be getting out of here. Soon. I wonder how confident. He was. I he Tiffany asked him that, and he said he was hopeful. And I think just knowing Lauren like we do, I think he he probably was pretty confident. He we've seen the power of his delusional mind. So I think he talked himself into really believing all these arguments were solid and you know, there really was a miscarriage of justice in his case. So I think yeah. he was pretty confident about it. I remember something like he planned to write a book exposing Someone yeah. I yeah. don't know who money line uh, or something. Yeah, that was in his uh his letter to his mother. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. I, I just wonder. I mean, where do you get this confidence? I think yeah. that if you've got to understand. For Lorne to have been caught in the circumstances that he were, there's a lot for somebody like him to go at because you've got the fact that you imagine being in his, try and put yourself in his mindset, somebody whose whole life is not taking responsibility, it's about shifting it, everybody else is to blame. You could point to all these things about, oh my god, there's this vigilante group, I'm going to have them. Oh my god, Chris Hansen claims he's a police officer, I'm going to have him. Oh my god, um, I pled guilty and they threatened me with, with uh, child pornography, that's bullshit. There's all these things that you can go at. Like all these, out, all there's a lot of elements which make up his crime. So there's a lot of other people involved, a lot of other entities. It's quite a complicated scenario. So he can twist that to his own, and, and and the Murphy thing is huge as well. I think that when he read and heard about that for the first time, he thought he thought, oh my god, this is my ticket. You know, I'm I'm free. This is my ticket out of here. So mm -hmm. that will just feed into his delusions even more, and that. I think that was the start of creating this huge victim mentality because he'll look at that and he doesn't see himself as one of these people to start with. If he would admit to himself deep down that he had a massive problem and that he was a dirt and that he was a manipulative, you know, like a really sick individual, let's not forget there's the humour. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you this, but Lon's a very twisted dark human being the shit that he came out with in that chat log is not normal for an adult man to come out with this guy needs years of therapy intense therapy therapy to become normal he's a very dangerous sadistic person 
Um, so his mind is going to run away in a million different directions and taking responsibility is not a priority. Taking the truth is not part of his agenda, is it? Yeah, he no. just likes to roll around a broken glass. It's, it's, he's incredibly selfish. Nothing will ever be his fault. And he'll even try to twist his wrongdoings into some sort of like heroic feat. He, he did it for a good reason, for yeah. a heroic reason. Um, like he went to, he, he told somebody, I think it was probably Ramona, that he went to the sting house to, to actually check on Kayla because she was a 13 year old girl and she was home alone and he was concerned about her and he was just trying to be a good guy. I mean, we heard that over and over again. I was just trying to be a nice guy. She said no one would talk to her. So I spoke to her not because I'm a dirty old pervert who wanted to, you know, abuse a child. I spoke to her to, to do her a favor to help her out. Cause I'm, I'm the hero. The same reason he talked to my space girl. She had a lot of problems. And, and then he, he was there for her. Yeah. And he says something contradictory, like she wasn't after my money. Mm-hmm. You know, which is the opposite of I'm there to make sure a child is okay. In that situ- in that scenario, the child wouldn't be you wouldn't have to worry about the child being a gold digger. You know? But mm-hmm. when he said she 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 was somebody who finally didn't want care about what was in my wallet or whatever it was. That that cuts against that argument that he came over to see a child to take care of her as a child. He's looking at her as a uh, as a romantic interest and somebody who was worthy of his attention because she didn't want his money. Right, but again, he doesn't want to be such a villain that he'll come right out and admit I I was interested in her because I wanted to take her virginity and destroy this innocence that she had. He thinks it'll make it slightly less evil to say, oh, it's because I was so starved for love because my family mistreated me that all I could see was somebody who finally was caring about me rather than wanting to use me like everybody else has used me. I'm such a victim. I'm such a hero. I lost all of my money because I have such a big heart. And that's actually a quote. I have such a big heart that I helped people out too much and lost all my money in, in the process. Yeah, that's a good point. He turned around that, that, mac and cheese story how is it that when he was going to say an example of his past it was because he was too good a person and got taken advantage of mm-hmm. it's remarkable isn't it he said that on one of his assignments for his rape class they asked him what will it take for you not to offend again or it wasn't worded that way but I think you understand what I mean uh, yeah. he said I need to not let people use me and give them all my yeah. money because then I will be depressed and heartbroken. He couldn't say no as well. Do you remember him? Exactly. Like, I couldn't right. say it's, fucking no. It's ridiculous. And that's why he's still in rape class because he takes no responsibility, no accountability. Everything is, is always somebody else's fault. Oh, you know, what's... Uh... Who was it? Uh, wrote us. Lauren says he's always loved kids. You know that. That's kind of strange. There was a one one uh, quote that he said. He sure has. He said, uh, "I've always loved kids, even when I was a kid." <laughs> yeah. That's so dumb. Most kids do like being around other kids. Yeah. It's a stupid thing to say. He's just dumb. How, how much do you think? There is to the fact that he still has a very immature mentality that he's never really grown up like a not too innocent, not lovable Peter Pan. I don't, I'm sorry to use that comparison because we think of a fairy tale heroic character, but what I mean is I have often thought and spoke about the fact that he's, he's, he's mentally, emotionally still still a teenager. He's never developed. Because as a child, you don't take responsibility, do you? You just don't. You know, when you're young, you cry. It's not my fault. My friend did it. He's yeah. very much stuck there, isn't he? Is this, 
this is what you know is the a defect going on there what happened what stunted his growth uh, I don't know exactly but it's not really that uncommon like that happens to yeah to whatever people it was, sometimes he brought on himself some certain combination of circumstances and character flaws and defects in him a, a lot of it um he's very weak he has zero impulse control it's like tiffany said or somebody maybe it wasn't tiffany i can't i can't remember now but when lauren says i couldn't say no at the time what he means is that he he can't say no to himself or he refuses to say no to himself which is just another way of saying he has no impulse control and even if he knows something is wrong he'll make excuses in his mind mm -hmm. so he can get what he wants he can't deny himself these things. Mm -hmm. he, he literally is. This is why I make these videos that 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 kind of delve into the sort of deeper elements. If he does make every single mistake, he learn. He teaches us what not to do with life. You look at Lorne and you do. You look at what he does and you do the exact opposite. You know, he, 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 every trick in the book, everything that you do to have a dysfunctional and a healthy unfulfilling life he does he is resourceful and he will work them are the only two things that i can think of as a positive trait for his character everything else he gets wrong L lv uh lord identity i've never heard that story that he told <laughs> Tell me that dumb fucking story about when he was nine and helped a five-year-old get up on stage to sing greatest american hero and he thinks that at 48, he should be still praised. <laughs> <laughs> I've not, is that, when did he divulge? I've not heard that. I, I, it's vaguely familiar to me. I think I remember hearing it. Um, but it, that's not unique. He, his own expectations for himself are so low that he he thinks he deserves praise for doing su such basic things you know, like a good example is when <laughs> Ramona said the doctor was great because he delivered a baby on the side of the road and Lauren's like oh well that's really fucking great I helped Bert <laughs> unload some hay <laughs> with my pups and he was serious I mean that's something you might say sarcastically but he was serious he's like oh you didn't give me any praise for that did ya I saved him some time. Brilliant. Absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Think about it. You know, that, that L, L.I. story about him helping a five-year-old kid on a stage when he was nine, how they could stick with him all these years. He doesn't. He probably doesn't have a lot of fond memories about good things he's done. There's probably very few and far in between. That's why he remembers this one. That's a strange memory to have. Well, think about it. Getting praised by, from his mother when he was a child probably didn't happen all that often. He's probably a pretty unremarkable kid. And she had several other children, too. So mm -hmm. I don't think he was babied and praised and given all this encouragement and told how wonderful he was a lot. So when he was given praise for something, he really was proud of himself and obviously carried it 40 years into the future. You know, yeah. and held on to it. He sees himself as a good person, and it's very, very interesting. What, what, like, I was listening to, um, it, it actually flashed up a couple of days ago on my random select on my iPhone. It was the I'm a predator call where Tiffany spoke to him. He referred to somebody else as a nice guy, and it's always interested me that when you see people, you hear about people who are inherently bad, like bad evil or whatever you want to however you want to label it i see evil as probably a little bit very differently than a lot of people do but i know when people are you can identify people that have no positive traits and lawn is one of them but he see he, he still has that judgment where he can he views other people as bad and he's good oh he's a nice guy and the doctor i don't fucking like him you know it, it amazes me that he just doesn't have any ability to look at, to self-analyze, and nothing that he could do is bad. I find it very interesting. It's a really interesting aspect of the human condition that, despite the most heinous things that a person can do, like he did, 
like what he tried to do with Kayla, yeah, he thinks of himself as a good guy. It's mental. But interesting. Well, it comes, yeah, it comes down to he'll believe whatever he has to believe about himself in order just to survive and to be able to face himself in the mirror every day. Of course, it's a survival strategy, and one can't blame a person for that. You know, at the end of the day, his whole psyche and his his, his survival mechanism, isn't it? But um, he doesn't realise that all the shortcuts that he takes, and it can be the same in anybody's life, all the shortcuts that you take ultimately don't work. (laughs) They just Mm -hmm. don't, ever And you think he would have learned that by now. But that's one of the interesting things about him is he just keeps repeating the same mistakes over and over again. I mean, he's been banking on these online relationships with women he's never met ever since before this thing. I'm not sure if Amanda James was the first, but she's one of the most notable and he he still hasn't learned from any of it. It's routine now. That's why. That's that's his life. Mm. That's that's where he gets his relationships. That's where he has his Yeah, exactly. It's it's an interesting we'll talk about it more in another video when we go into the the catfishing in detail. That has become the norm for him. Like when he you know, that I do I do really enjoy those old early Ramona calls what I like about him is he didn't get sadistic like a lot of the others did, in my opinion. Like, it's just two people in a relationship. I know that whoever Ramona was wasn't, but at the time I was listening to it, I actually thought it was a genuine relationship, and I found it... I still get something out of listening to that. It's incredible to listen to. But that kind of scenario has become the norm for him. It's it's crazy. Like, it's, someone could live like that. And I think that... Is that far gone now that he was ever faced with a real relationship? God forbid, he wouldn't be able to do it. No, I, I agree. I, I think this is all he. I think he. I think he realizes that too. I mean, does he? Talk, know? Yeah, we talked about that before. He's he. he again, I, I don't want to repeat myself, but he gets more angry at the fact that somebody doesn't pick up the phone rather than blow him off, saying that they were going to come visit him. Mm-hmm. Or he'll find out that they're lying about some major, yeah. you know, major thing about their identity. And that he'll figure out that they sent him pictures of girls from Google <laughs> rather than pictures of themselves or, you know, whatever it is. And you're rich and he'll get more angry about them not answering the phone or having a mail within 500 feet of them, which means they're cheating. Yeah, that, that... I, I, yeah, that's why I think he's he's satisfied with these catfish relationships. I think he's that fulfills him. I mean, it, for him, for anybody to actually come and visit him, he, I think in the back of his mind, he realizes, you know, his hobo life isn't something that every every girl dreams of. Um, so he can create his own little world on a telephone. Um, mm-hmm. Look at, you know, we talked about this before, and you guys didn't kind of didn't agree with it, but if he was with a real woman. Uh, first of all, it wouldn't last that long, and she would have to be feeble-minded, I guess. But um, I, I don't know um, how he would settle into that life. I don't know. I mean, he's never had a girlfriend, right? We know that. Uh, he admitted that. Uh, so he's never had a relationship. And his relationships are all de- uh, depend on basically two issues. You're cheating on me or you're lying to me. Those are, those are basically what, what he thinks relationships are all about. And that's probably from parroting his parents or, or you know Dale and uh, uh, Gwen going at it you know the same or even his brothers and their and their uh, their wives but I don't know I think to, I think he'd be scared to think that somebody came in and guess what they're gonna stick with you for a long time now um, but not unconditionally if it was unconditionally he'd be fine he would definitely be scared. Yes, that that would be his his number one goal. Would be keeping that person, trapping them, trying to figure out some way to make sure that they can't leave. Right. The closest. Be it by they, marriage. Yeah. Isolating he, he, them from their friends and family. Right. Absolutely. Especially now, 
they would definitely not want to want their child or sister or whatever to be with somebody like that um, when they have such a such access to their public record. Yeah, oh my God, can you imagine just googling him? I don't know. Let me see who you're dating now. Oh my God, but um, I don't know. I think he. I think he's satisfied. I think this, as long as he feels like he's in a relationship, you know, that I, I keep going back to that phone call that Raptor uh, put up about the, him talking to himself for three hours. Well, he really, <laughs> what, what was yeah. that? I love that one. Just that. No, but yeah, who, I mean, was he, who did he think he was talking to? He thought he was talking to Winnie, but Winnie, you know, was on the phone recording, obviously, but she didn't say anything. So we got, we got to hear so going, there's none of there's none of her yeah. voice then. No, no right, I'll have a listen yeah. to that then. Well, you got to say a single word. word. But you got to put headphones on too. Um, but you hear everything. You hear the interactions between him and Roy. You hear him as soon as he gets up in the morning. And by the way, I didn't hear him brush his teeth at all. And he takes oh, a, good point. And he takes a sixteen to seventeen minute uh, shower. Uh, and, and, and the water, the way it comes off his body, it sounds like it's sludge. I can't believe you. You're talking about the contours of Lord's body as the water's dripping off. Give the guy a fucking break, dude. He's like wading around in, in, in like seven inches of water, too. You know, it's just so sloppy and gross. It's, <laughs> Have you heard that, guys? Lawn doesn't do very well in a, in a shower. The water just doesn't fall well, off him right. That because what he does, he's, he, as he's, uh, he, you know, he's, he's talking, to Winnie, even though Winnie's not responding, and he's going through his whole day and what he's doing, and he's happy that, you know, that he's got Doritos in his truck, and that's what he does. He smokes a cigarette, he drinks coffee, doesn't brush his teeth, and eats Doritos in the morning. That that's what happened. I mean, if that's not gross enough, but um, and 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 the other thing is he he's got this. He emotionally invests in these weird things, these very small, petty things. Like him and Roy got into a little argument, <clears throat> and Roy settled him down by saying, "You're getting pizza tomorrow night." I mean, who thinks about having food the next night, right? Who thinks about that? But that, you know, that that sat well with him. But that's the kind of uh, everything's an immediate thought. Everything is is what's in front of his face, and that's it. But yeah. that phone call is so illuminating because... I'm gonna it, have it, li- when was that put out? Uh, just like two or three weeks ago. Well, right. It's a three-hour call. It's a three-hour video. Right. I'll, check, I'll definitely check that out because I do... I, I have to... Yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can... Because some of them... I don't, I don't yes, like a lot of those. He take, just before he gets in the shower... Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Hunter. I don't mean to do that. But, but uh, he says to Roy, I'm taking Winnie in with me. You know, it's like, oh, God. <laughs> you got to listen to it. I will do. Uh, what gonna... you take away most from it is that Lauren just wants someone to talk to. That's it. You can He's tell so that. He's so lonely. Yeah, you, you you do occasionally a little bit of empathy creeps through. And you go, oh, the, is anybody that lonely? And then obviously you think it's Lauren and what he tried to do and it disappears. But, you know, we're... We're wired to have empathy for for the suffering another of another creature. You do think, you know, God, what a shame. One point in the phone call where he says, um, you know, he says it several times. He says it to Roy and he says it to himself later on. He says, uh, when he's on the phone, but she's not talking right now, but at least I'm glad she's on the phone with me. Yeah, and that's true. That's well, yeah. better than nothing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and on the note of Lonely Lawn, I'm going to have to... Um, Go to bed, because um, um, it's very late here, and uh, this has a little been a bit a little bit longer than the usual um, streams that we do, just a, a little bit. But so because we started a bit earlier, because um, mm. I'm always mindful of cutting off before our time is done. I mean, we could go all day and night, couldn't we? But um, <laughs> yeah, um, I'm gonna have to get cracking. But um, thanks um, for joining us again, um, Shins Koala and Tiff and. Tiffany, I nearly called you Tiffany then, Amanda James. Uh, but thanks for joining us anyway. It's been, I hope you've enjoyed it. Yes, of course. Thank you for having me. It's always fun. Anytime. Um, so thanks for, there's been quite a few people in the chat as always. I do appreciate it. Um, thanks for joining us, everybody. Was, you know, there's no point unless you're coming in and making, I'm sorry I don't have to, I can't chat with everybody during the, 
stream because you know I have to obviously have to make sure that the page is coming and we have, the stream's flowing. So, um, but I have been keeping an eye on what you people have been coming out uh, with. So, um, goodbye to Erodo, Sean French, uh, Kingpin, uh, my enemy, SC, Matthew Leclerc, Lon Identity here. And uh, Rhoda's Chewed Tootsie. What is Rhoda's Chewed Tootsie? <laughs> Ro what? You know who the Rhoda character is. Is that Winnie's daughter or something? That's Winnie's daughter. And the last prank she played before she died, tragically, was she chewed up a Tootsie, a Tootsie Roll, and stuck it to the toilet seat so it would look like shit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, I wish she had a vast now. <laughs> Watson was here too, Andrew. Yeah, I said hello to her before, yeah. Um, and if you're still listening, hey, Watson, uh, goodbye. It's been a pleasure. Hey. And thanks to thanks to everybody. Um, thanks for clobbering hey. time, for dropping by as well. And we might get back to the chat log next week. Uh, we'll have to see where we're up to. Um, we've got plenty of stuff to... This stuff will never dry up. We could just go over the chat log over and over again. It'd be like the repeats of Star <laughs> Trek on on TV. It's like goes round and round and round. Oh, they're back to the page one again. They're back to fucking talking about the nieces. Um, so, yeah, thanks for joining me to my two friends here and everybody in the chat. I'm going to have to bail off and... Uh, Get my head down, um, ready for uh, life without, you know, without lawn. 